Hello and welcome to this fifth in my series of CPD Coffee Times with me, Dr. Tina Ray. Um, today we're going to look at the concept of emotional literacy and how we can develop our skills of emotion coaching with children and young people. So very briefly, I previously was a teacher. I've been working as a psychologist since 2000 and I'm currently a psychologist, consultant psychologist for a fostering agency and also work in private practice. One of my main roles, however, is that I write. I have written quite prolifically in the area of mental health and well-being for children and young people, and I'm passionate about this. So you'll find many of my publications with Nurture UK. I'm very, very proud to be associated over time, long time now, actually, with this charity. I also write extensively for Sarah Miles at Hinton House Publishers Limited um, and I'm very, very proud of the books that we've produced. I'm going to make reference to some of them and make use of some of the strategies, particularly from the Essential Resilience and Wellbeing Toolkit for early years in today's presentation. So the main focus today is, is around looking at emotional intelligence, defining it and also thinking about how we use it in our relationships and connections with others. And then also how that enables us to engage in emotion coaching with children and young people in order to support them to self-regulate more effectively. So what is emotional intelligence? In essence, it's the ability to identify and understand our own emotions and feelings and to see, successfully use them during social interactions. Um, also, to be able to use emotions in order to solve problems and manage frustration and anxiety appropriately, withholding self-gratification when you know we want something, we can't quite get it as soon as we want to have it. Um, and also from preventing us, I suppose, from becoming overwhelmed by emotions um, so that that impacts negatively on our con cognitive functions, our, our ability to think and process and problem solve. So basically being emotionally intelligent means that we can um, maintain a level of autonomy um, regarding how and when we express our feelings. So in essence, there are four key components of emotional intelligence or emotional literacy. Perceiving emotions, understanding them, using them and managing them. So four key elements. Why is this so important? It's in essence, it's actually vital for us to develop skills of emotional intelligence in the sense that we can then become autonomous and we will in subsequently, I, I feel, have lower levels of stress in our lives and we're able to better cope and manage with the everyday stresses that we all are going to experience. And um, also, I think what happens then in the sense of having less stress, what we also do is we, we tend to have better physical, um, emotional health overall. Being emotionally intelligent also enables us to maintain and foster positive relationships and connections with others because basically they can be lasting and intimate because we understand how to give and take, how to empathise. Emotionally intelligent individuals also can self-regulate. They know how to self-soothe um, and they can really focus even when things are particularly challenging for them. So ultimately, to be emotionally intelligent means that you are more resilient and you can cope more effectively when things get stressful. Um, and this is obviously particularly pertinent at the time of recording when we're all having to cope with the additional stress and anxiety around the whole COVID-19 pandemic. So how does emotional intelligence develop? We know that it's influenced by our environment and the socialization which includes our parents, relationships with siblings. The influence of teachers is particularly important as our peer relationships and other significant others in um, our lives, such as grandparents, carers or childcare workers. Uh, we also know, um, and this is the nature nurture debate again, um, but we, do, we know that some children are born with more difficult reactive emotional styles. And so these are the children um, who are more anxious, who find things more difficult to manage emotionally, um, who will need more input, additional input and support from parents or carers to teach them how to regulate and manage emotional styles. I love this quote from Aristotle, the Nicomedean Ethics it's from. Um, he says, to be angry with the right person to the right degree at the right time for the right purpose and in the right way. 
And essentially for me, in a nutshell, that is emotional intelligence. And I think it's a lifelong journey because most of us would say that we kind of fall, fall short of this at times. So I, I just think it's a lovely quote to kind of really, I suppose, put it into a nutshell and say, this is what I really think emotional intelligence is. It's being able to manage those difficult, complex feelings so that they don't overwhelm us and so that we can manage and use emotions effectively in our social relationships. Paul Greenhalge. Um, wrote a long time ago um, about emotional literacy in a great deal of depth. Um, he stated that children need to become aware of feelings in order that their own and others might in turn be acknowledged, managed, accepted and thought about. So how does this develop? Emotional literacy has its separate skills and they develop over time. So the skill of recognising, naming and describing feelings. So this develops from the baby's crude non-verbal expression of two or three emotions through to the mature adult's ability to recognise and name a wide range of different feelings. And very often when I'm working with children, we do initially just look at what our feelings labels are, how many we know, what we understand by them, how we experience them. And if I do a quick egg timer test, we will sit down and say, how many can we jot down or think of in three minutes? And it's quite interesting doing this with adults as well. Most people will, I think, probably come up with angry, sad, happy, excited, frightened, scared. Um, but it, it will be very unusual to find a sort of five or six year old child who can name um, more, more complex emotions. So it's something that develops over time. So it develops this capacity for understanding of these feelings or empathy developing from the small child's smile at another per person's pleasure to that ability of some adults to pick up very subtle clues from others and to feel for them basically, that, that notion of empathy in relation to imagined situations. Um, it's also the ability to manage one's own feelings, so developing from being totally overwhelmed by them in infancy, you know, that kind of emotional hijack that, that little, the that, that terrible twos get, to the later ability to control and channel anger in, in an effective way, consciously being able to reduce anxiety and reframe situations mentally so that we can handle the emotions they produce more effectively. And of course, this makes reference back to my first session in this CPD Coffee Time series when we looked at cognitive behavioural therapy approaches and tools to use with children and young people. So over time, emotional intelligence also incorporates the skills of communication. So becoming more able to talk about feelings, becoming a good listener, an effective listener, an active listener, and learning about negotiation and conflict resolution, how to manage difficult situations when we're in disagreement with others so that we actually effectively reach a conclusion and meet the goals that we want to meet. Also, the ability to set goals and solve problems overall, it develops from that young child's immediate goals and inability to wait, so that inability to delay gratification through to this mature capacity for us to evaluate different solutions to problems and plan for the longer term, thinking ahead, thinking longer term, as opposed to just now, just the immediate moment in time. So in my view, um, there are essentially five good reasons that we need to, or for teaching emotional literacy, we need to do this for these particular five reasons, because it does help children to achieve in their schoolwork. Of course, they can concentrate better. They can achieve more if they're able to self-soothe, if they're able to manage both socially in and out of the classroom context. It enables them to also succeed and continue to succeed once they've left school to hold down jobs, sustain relationships and to make a contribution to society. And clearly this is really, really important because without the ability to manage your own feelings and to delay self-gratification, then it's going to be very difficult for you to be in a workplace and work as part of a team effectively. It also promotes mental health, and this is hugely important, um, particularly now when we know that mental health problems are increasing at an alarming rate. And given the whole um, COVID-19 pandemic, it's becoming more and more essential that we protect and nurture and foster children's mental health, because many of them are under far more stress than they ever have been previously. It also makes teaching easier. When schools have got an emotional literacy programme in place, an intervention and a whole school approach, 
they found that the school becomes a more harmonious place. So there, there should be fewer tensions, fewer quarrels, less fights and aggressions in the playground. And this is really, really important. The children will be more task focused and it, of course it makes it easier for the adults. They spend less time sorting out those problems that are the result of, ch of children not being emotionally literate. It's also essentially about promoting understanding and tolerance in schools and in society. If we've learned how to understand other people's feelings, we're less likely to be drawn into discrimination or bullying and less likely to join in with the kind of hatreds that set group against group. We're more likely to be the valued peacemakers, so problem solvers and friends. So for me, ultimately, there's a really important message here about the need to promote this level of understanding and tolerance if we want to have a world that is really somewhere that nurtures and ensures that everyone's well-being is, is, is protected. Ekman, um, as far back as 2003, highlighted the basic emotions with very clear facial sign signals that we all experience. And this is cross-cultural research. So being very, very clear, he took loads and loads and loads of photos in very um, nomadic communities in particular and found that when looking at these, it was very clear that all of these different cultures were able to show these basic emotions with very clear facial signals. So anger, sadness, fear, surprise, disgust and happiness. So if we're teaching children an emotional vocabulary, which is what I think we start with generally in um, emotional literacy interventions, we may, might start with eight man's five emotions and then begin to extend that and use visuals, um, emojis, etc. in order to actually prompt children to learn and remember these particular feelings and, and broaden their range. So as part of an emotional literacy or intelligence curriculum, we, we need to actually ensure that children can understand emotions. So we, we would do a lot of talking, reading, using puppets, using lovely storybooks, etc., to ensure that they can recognise what events are likely to trigger, trigger different emotions for them and know that actually emotions can combine to form complex blends of feelings. So, for example, if I am feeling angry about something, it may be because prior to feeling angry, I actually had a sense of embarrassment. I felt let down. I felt really insecure. But that led to this feeling of anger, which then led to behaviours which were not particularly appropriate in a classroom context. So it's knowing about the combinations and where the feelings come from. Realising that emotions can progress over time time and transition one to another and also ensuring that children develop a rich emotional vocabulary so that we get more precise in terms of describing the feelings and blends of feelings that we experience. So managing emotions also is a key element of any emotional literacy intervention. So being able to stay open to the feelings, blending emotions with thinking and reflectively being able to monitor those emotions. And also managing emotions clearly so and we particularly would um, focus on the management of more complex difficult emotions such as stress, anxiety, fear, anger. The research has shown us that there is a significant relationship between managing emotions ability and burnout and mental health. So this is the real core reason I think why this is so important that we teach our children to be emotionally literate but we also ourselves develop these skills and model emotional literacy, emotional intelligence to the children that we teach. And I think it's really, really important as well just to flag up again that teams with higher scores for managing emotions received higher performance rankings. I call it the Andy Murray effect. So a two, two really kind of important elements that come from the research here. So if you're doing this on your own or you're doing it as part of a group CPD activity with other colleagues, this is a little activity that I think is really helpful just to get you thinking about how you as an individual respond to situations which can be quite challenging. So you're, you're in a meeting when a colleague takes credit for the work you've done, what do you do? So A, immediately confront the colleague saying that you did the research. Uh, B, after the meeting, take the colleague aside, tell him or her that in future you'd appreciate credit for the work you did. Uh, C, nothing. It's best not to embarrass colleagues in public. And D, after the colleague speaks publicly, thank him or her for referencing your work and provide additional details about the work. And I think here what I'm trying to get at, I suppose, is the need for us to be assertive 
not passive aggressive um, and also to be empathic but but not to actually engage in any kind of learned helplessness so we don't want to go for the C option, but interesting, what would you do? Why would you do that? Um, how would you manage the emotions that this might generate this particular challenging situation? And I would just reference back to um, emotional intelligence, why it matters more than IQ by Daniel Goleman, 1995 Bloomsbury books. Um, just to say, if you're interested in this, there is so much evidence to show that what really matters is your EQ, your emotional quotient. You don't have to have a I, I, high IQ. People who are um, really, really successful, and I'm, I'm thinking of CEOs, that um, there's a lot, lot of research that um, Daniel Goldman re makes reference to in his book, showing that they are more successful, not because they have um, huge IQ levels at the top end of the continuum, they certainly don't. They're, they're generally average if you're going to, to assess IQ, but what they do have is a high emotional quotient. They know how to manage their own feelings. They know how to manage the feelings of others and how to empathise and how to motivate team members, how to bring them on in the right way that's nurturing and that's challenging in a very, um, I would say, creatively critical way. So that what we actually achieve here is a team that is really, really powerful in terms of working together, feeling confident and competent, but it has to be led by the leader who is emotionally intelligent, him or herself. So very often people with higher IQs are not able to do this. Um, and I think that that's really, really important to factor into our thinking. It's a really powerful reason as to why um, we need to value this EQ and really promote it with the children and young people that we teach and nurture. But developing your own emotional literacy can present a challenge and we know this. Basically there are two types of learning, so the cognitive learning, so when we're absorbing new data, gaining insights into existing frameworks of association, so I may be learning something new in terms of how to um, make use of a, a particular computer program, etc. And I'll go through it step by step and I'll absorb the information and begin to process it. Then there is the emotional learning. So we're engaging the part of br the brain where our emotional signature is stored. And this involves new ways of thinking. And essentially this can be more challenging. So for example, I can learn something cognitively, but if someone challenges me and says, you know, I think you've got a problem with your anger here, you need to actually manage this more effectively, and immediately there's something about the emotionality of all of this that can be more challenging to me as an individual and feel more personal. So some ideas about emotions. We know that we have the thinking part of the brain and the feeling part, which is responsible for that quick response, fight or flight response. When I'm talking to children about this, I always get them to think about if, uh, the situation where they might see a dangerous animal, such as a big tiger. They would see it and respond with the emotional brain very quickly. And your body will prepare you to either fight or flight. Your heart will quicken, your blood pressure will rise and your muscles tense. So at a slower pace, your thinking brain might register that this is in fact a life-size toy and you're not in any danger at all, but your body is ready and you might already have responded and run. So this would be important if there is real danger, because this is something in terms of actually managing to survive. We would need to run to escape the danger. So even if this was a life sized giant toy, um, young children and those with poorly developed skills of emotional management would respond to that first emotional interpretation. So what is important is to make sure that we begin to be able to develop the capacity to stop and think before we actually respond. So rather than um, letting ourselves be overtaken by the emotion, being emotionally hijacked is, is a term that I like to use, what we have to think about here is how we actually can respond in a way that is more effective. So I very often draw out to traffic lights for children that I work with, particularly younger ones, and we'll think about the red as being the stop moment, the stop light. And then when we get to the amber light, that's the time in which we stop, we think, we process, we problem solve. So what could I do first, second, third? What should I do now? Thinking about how am I feeling? How should I respond? Who can help me in this situation? And then saying, what should I do first, second, third, if that's appropriate? And then this is my plan. This is what I'm going to try out now. So then the green light 
being go is what I will then do. I will then I will actually execute my plan. So in, in essence, it's about actually getting the young child or the younger child to stop, think and reflect rather than just simply react. So it links obviously directly with the CBT approach that I outlined in my first of these CPD coffee time sessions. So it's also important to ensure that children understand how the build-up of emotional arousal actually happens and that this can be something that occurs over time and it can actually render us completely ready to explode with aggression or another strong emotional reaction. The idea is that we can teach children to prevent this um, emotional arousal from becoming something that they can't actually manage by using strategies to help us calm down, to self-soothe. And again, many of these I will have talked about in my second session on, in this series on anxiety. And such strategies um, are, are clearly beneficial to most children and young people, particularly with heightened levels of anxiety. So obviously mindfulness works for many of us. Um, the ability to self-soothe using grounding, visualisation, deep breathing, etc. So again, please make reference to my um, second session in this series for a, a lot more information about those particular ways of actually helping us to calm down and relax. What's very important as well is that we also understand this notion of emotional memory. If something that elicits an emotion happens to us, we not only have a memory of what happens, but also of the very strong emotions that were elicited. And this can be very, very long lasting. And the problem here is that when we experience a similar situation and we kind of almost like we relive it, we will experience those strong emotions again. And sometimes for younger children, it's difficult to understand the connection here. Also, part of emotional literacy and teaching emotional literacy, I will be very, very clear about ensuring that children understand that anger has um, a really important function in our lives. We need to be angry if we are faced with injustice, someone's been racist, sexist, homophobic, etc. That's understandable because actually it really generates us to go and try and sort things out and problem solve and make things better and justice can be done in effect. Um, what we need to understand is how anger looks and what it feels like physically in our bodies and I think that Going through the assault cycle with children and young people is really, really helpful. So knowing um, and teaching them how they can identify the triggers, what actually causes them to feel angry in the first place, but also knowing that this they can then escalate. And when it reaches the crisis phase, it's usually um, when there has been a real sense of emotional hijack and the child will have an outburst. The problem then, in many instances, is there is not enough time given to the child to actually recover and to move through that plateau or recovery phase of the assault cycle to go back down into the post crisis depression phase where they can actually get down to their baseline behavior physiologically they can get the heart rate at a normal rate and they can stop breathing in such a quick um, rapid way etc so i think it's really really important that they understand this because obviously during that plateau or recovery phase there is the possibility of additional assault so for example when a child is coming in from the playground they've had an argument with a friend and they are told to say sorry um, to the other child if they've hurt them or upset them they might well do this but they won't do it with any real feeling or meaning um, because actually they're not in a place yet to have reflected and to have calmed down properly um, and the problem here is that they could sit down in class next to the child who has said something nasty to them and they just need to give them another dirty look or another snidey comment and basically that child will explode again because they haven't calmed down. And this concept of the assault cycle was devised following investigations into why police officers were frequently assaulted following an arrest. And I think it really does help us to understand why small incidents of misbehaviour can really escalate quite easily. What's really vital to know is that that recovery phase for adults, for us adults, can take up to about an hour and a half, you know, 90 minutes after a serious incident for our body physiologically to return to normal. So I think it's really, really important that we wait, we give children the time and the place and the space to begin to calm down, to reflect, to think, 
to use some of their tools to calm down and self-soothe, but to do it in a safe way and in a context where they're not going to be susceptible to further incidents or um, to be riled up by other children who may have upset them. So that, that has implications for how we sort this out in the school and what facilities are made available. Do you have that little quiet room, not a sin bin, not a naughty child room, but a, a calming place, a calming corner, a calming tent um, where someone can go with their calm box, take their items out, etc. I think this is really, really important. And someone one with who that child can talk through when they are ready. And very often they won't be ready for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And I, I think it's really important to use visuals with children too here. So this firework model from Novako's model for anger arousal is really helpful still in, in many of the um, interactions I have with children who are experiencing difficulties in this area. Just to give them that visual, this is what happens. The trigger is the match that ignites that person's fuse. The fuse is the mind reacting, your thoughts, your feelings, so experiencing that sense of fear or threat. Then the explosive cylinder is the body responding physiologically. And this might lead to anger being expressed. It could be either expressed verbally or physically for younger children in particular. So ultimately, let's just think a little bit about how we would raise our EQ. How do we really do this for ourselves? Because I've talked a lot about... Um, children and how we begin to introduce them to a, an emotional vocabulary and ways to self-soothe and manage strong feelings. Um, it's really important that we learn how to express our feelings in words, that we develop that vocabulary, all of us, adults and children alike. We need to be asking other people how they feel. If we can't tell, if we can't see, if, we, if we're not sure, and we need to be able to connect our feelings to the events or situations that cause them to help others do the same. So again, something about us as adults being able to model this to children. And sometimes I think we need to spend a, a little bit of time not being self-obsessed, but being a little bit more reflective and thinking about things that disturb us or areas that we want to improve and actually really think about how we can move on with that. And before we act on feelings, we need to consider consequences, particularly what effects our behaviour has on other people. And looking at alternatives, if, if our choice doesn't seem particularly good, what other ways can we express our feelings that would be more productive and helpful and nurturing of others and ourselves? So a key strategy moving on to emotion coaching is what we would use with children and young people, particularly in the early years. Um, and in essence, this is around developing emotional intelligence in young people. And very, very important that children who are emotion coached are those who are able to develop appropriate levels of emotional literacy. They can trust their feelings, regulate, self-regulate and solve problems. So these are usually the children who've got reasonably good levels of self-esteem and they can connect with people and make positive relationships. Essentially, this is what we want for all our children and young people. So Gottman's theory of emotion coaching is basically an extension of Dr. Hayne Gino's work with children. And he suggests that just like athletic coaches, emotion coaching parents, teachers, adults, nurturers, teach their children strategies for dealing with life's ups and downs. They don't object for the child's display of anger, sadness or fear. They don't say this is wrong or this is bad or negate it. Um, they don't ignore them. What they do is they accept negative emotions as a fact of life and use emotional moments as opportunities for teaching their children important life lessons and building closer relationships with them through problem solving processes. So emotion coaching generally is around and about thinking, helping children and young people to understand the different emotions they experience, why they have those emotions, why they happen, why they occur and how to manage them or handle them effectively. And training parents and practitioners in emotion coaching is really helpful and useful because basically what, what this does is it enables the carers and parents and teachers to actually support children's capacity for pro-social behaviour and self-regulation. So again, just highlighting the fact here, this is support and not dictate. So therefore, that's why we have the notion of emotion coach. Important to highlight that this is not a therapy. This is something that all of us as practitioners, parents, carers can actually use in order to support our children to gain the skills of emotional literacy and be able to self-regulate. It's not a quick fix or panacea. It's not a substitute for specific emotional literacy interventions or therapeutic interventions. Um, so ultimately, I think it's important to highlight that. This is something that all of us can develop in terms of um, supporting and nurturing our children and young people. 
So what happens in and to our bodies when we have this flight, fight, freeze, appease response, which I talked about when I was talking about seeing the um, tiger at the beginning in, in, in the section on emotional literacy. Um, we need to um, really understand what is happening here in our bodies and children need to be taught this to fear, excitement and effort. It's normal and natural as a hormonal response in the short term. Experiencing this is essential to keep ourselves safe. But in the long term, this actually can be quite damaging. We have the vagus nerve, which acts as a break on bodily functions and it slows down the heartbeat and it helps us to return the system to normal. So think about that escalation of the anger um, in the Valko's model. Um, we've got to think here about the vagus nerve as being the thing that actually breaks those bodily functions, slows down the heartbeat and helps us to return physiologically to normal. So our vagal tone is, is basically how well our fight flight response and vagus nerve are balanced and work together. So if we have good vagal tone, we will respond quicker. We'll have faster information processing. We can concentrate better. And when we've been angry or upset or distressed, we can return more easily to a normal resting state. Those with poor vagal tone have less speedy responses, poorer processing. They don't remember things. They don't process the information properly. So they present as being often in classroom situations quite um, aggressive and unable or unwilling to follow instructions when actually they've not been able to process or retain the information their working memory can be compromised so again these are the children who have much more problem in terms of returning back into a normal resting state after an eruption but the hopeful element here is that vagal tone is activated by soothing compassion physical comfort empathy and relationships with nurturing adults that teach us to self-soothe. So although we know that the environment and genetics contribute to our vagal tone, for all of us, like emotional literacy, in essence, we are all capable of actually learning how to self-soothe and further activate that vagal tone if we are given the right kind of nurture and support. We can develop this capacity. So how can we help those with less developed vagal tone or emotional literacy? This is the hopeful message basically, is that this neurological resilience to self-soothe is fostered by the emotional climate in the home and the classroom. And as adults, as those who are nurturing our children and young people, we have the capacity to ensure that this takes place. So what emotion coaching involves is about teaching the children in the moment about the world of emotion when they're in a, a distressed state and they're getting angry about something or upset or they're unhappy and supporting them to develop strategies to deal with these ups and downs, accepting all these emotions as normal, not pathologizing them and seeing them as the negative behavior as opportunities for teaching, not as opportunities to punish. So it's also about building trusting and respectful relationships with our children. And if we're going to do this effectively, we have to engage in a wee bit of self-reflecting. So it's very important for us to kind of think, what is our parenting or teaching style? And I think as a teacher or a parent, there is a level in both roles that kind of overlap. So for many um, children and young people, the, the teaching role, particularly in the early years, is very similar to that of a parent. And I think it's really, really important that we reflect on this role and how we can actually gain the level of mastery we need um, in terms of actually giving children the opportunity to develop their skills. We need to reflect on it. We know that um, parenting style basically is it's the standard strategies that parents use in bringing up their children. It evolves over time. It's affected by both our parents and children's temperaments um, and it's largely based on the influence of one's own parents and culture. So if we ask each other, you know, what, how, how do you parent? Why do you parent that way? It will usually be because I've actually had this model to me by my own parents. So I, I basically just followed their style or pattern of parenting, unless, of course, that style or patterning um, style or pattern of parenting has not been helpful or productive. So Diana Bromond, um, identifies these types but she added the fourth um, type of parenting later that of negligent but she's um, identified authoritarian parents so these are the ones who are really quite strict with their children tell them exactly what to do but they tend not to give reasons why they would like the child to comply with requests permissive or indulgent parents who allow their children to do whatever they want and again very very um, 
some very negative outcomes for some of the children who have such parents. However, there is a positive upside to this and that some of these children can learn very early on to be quite independent. Authoritative parenting um, basically provides rules and guidance as an authoritarian parent would do, but without being overbearing, being empathetic and, and being understanding and explaining the reasons and the rationale for the way that things are being done in the home. The fourth style added lately was negligence. So parents totally disregarding the children, focusing on other interests, primarily themselves and putting themselves in front of their children. Of course, this is the kind of parenting that we really are most concerned about. So ultimately, the key element in parenting is how parents help their children to develop emotional literacy or intelligence. And one of the ways to do this um, is via emotion coaching. So five key steps to it, basically. And the first one is to become aware of the child's emotion. And this is particularly important when they're lower intensity ones, such as a, a wee bit of sadness or they're disappointed about someone or frustrated. So actually noticing that and viewing them as an opportunity for intimacy and teaching and try not to be impatient when the child is expressing something negative emotionally. So communicating, understanding and acceptance and then helping them to use words. So again, this is emotional literacy, how to use words to describe how they feel and then helping them to set limits or problem solve. OK, you might have to do both. But I think it's really, really important that, you know, in that setting limits, you may have to communicate that, you know, all wishes and feelings are acceptable, but some behaviours are not. So making that distinction and separating the two. I've adapted this to uh, make it into a three step approach, which I think is fairly straightforward for both teachers and parents to use. Um, and the first step is using scripts. Then step two is setting limits if they're needed. And step three is problem solving. So very simple three step approach. So the scripts that we develop, they, they will enable us to empathise validate what the child is feeling so you know we're actually acknowledging it we're feeling with them and for them but we're saying what it is and helping them to label it so I can see you get angry when that happens I'd feel angry if that happened to me it's normal to feel like that what I would say at the outset here is, is you do have to be very, very clear in order for this to be really authentic. It has to be your style, has to be your kind of language and your kind of way of responding with the children, and young people. Um, and it can't be something kind of man manufactured. So I think it is around, you know, just thinking about this. What would I say there if I was going to develop this script for this particular child next time? I'm really reflecting on that, but making it something that you feel comfortable with. So the narrative, the language you use is something that just comes naturally to you. So step two, setting limits on the behaviour. Um, these are the rules that we all have to follow doing that's not OK. We can't behave like that, even though you're feeling annoyed because it's not safe. So I'm giving you a reason why. OK, you didn't put the ball away as we agreed. You probably got angry that you can't play with Billy now because you have to stop now. And then step three, problem solving. Uh, with a child or young person script. So, you know, next time you're feeling like this, what could you do? How could you, do, how do you think you would react if this happens again? You need to sit next to Emma or in front of me. Which one do you want to do? I'm giving you the choice, but actually it's limited choice because um, this is helping you to problem solve and try and sort the situation out at this point in time. And emotion tuning is part of this whole emotion coaching process. So noticing the emotion, clarifying with a question. So this notion of curiosity again, reflecting, reflect that emotion back with the child. OK, um, you know, allocating it in the body. So actually helping them to do that. Empathise. I understand this. I can really feel that, you know, you feel this way and why you feel this way and explore with them a bit. This notion again, curiosity. Were you scared when you couldn't find me? When Michael ignored you, how did you feel? Yeah, I think I might feel like that, etc. So if you're doing this on your own, um, use this as a reflection activity. If you're doing this with some colleagues and just have a, a quick chat together and think about your own parents or reflecting on conversations with friends. What are some of the ways people can be dismissive of emotions? So, for example, telling you not to worry, because this is a key problem for many of us. We will have experienced this in our own childhoods. And very often ways of dismissing emotions do include giving advice. So, you know, you can straight away, this is a problem, this is what I'm feeling. And, oh, well, this is what I did in that situation. This is what I would do. And that is really quite dismissive because I'm, you know, I'm not being heard in that, in that sense. Asking a child why. 
um, they said or did what they did. If you've been emotionally hijacked, you actually don't know. And you're not being naughty by saying, I don't know. You really don't know. So there's no point telling them not to worry. Talking only about yourself. Um, that's very, very typical. Jumping straight into problem solving without actually letting the child experience this validation and, and letting them experience the opportunity to describe how they're feeling. Taking the side of the other person instead of listening to the child's perspective or simply offering distractions. I understand in the busy classroom, sometimes this has to be done as part of actually, let's just move this child away for safety's sake. But actually, this is not always helpful. If you just say to me, acknowledge this now for two minutes and give me that time so that you actually say you've noticed how I'm feeling. You help me locate it. You talk to me through possibly a problem solving but you actually then give me the opportunity to express myself rather than just tell me to go and play in the sand or whatever it is I think this is really really important that can be done very quickly as you can see from these three steps and emotion coaching communication itself is, is really really important to, to develop over time when you do emotion coach you attend to the emotions the child experiences so that involves thinking about how they're probably feeling possibly considering a comparable situation for yourself and helping them to put a verbal label on that feeling. An emotion coach and communication, you, you might respond by asking, did that make you feel angry when you couldn't do that some or you got it wrong? Were you feeling sad when you were left out of the game in the playground, etc.? So really thinking and then, you know, this would make me feel the same way too. So helping them to further reflect by reflecting upon how you would feel in a similar situation yourself. And this slide just gives us a few reflecting feeling statements that you might hear or use yourself. But again, as I said uh, a, a while ago, I think it's really, really important that you develop your own style here. You can also pair comments um, about negative feelings with positive coping statements as well. So, for example, I can see you're getting really frustrated when the tower keeps falling over. But if you keep on trying, hopefully it will stay up eventually. So again, it's about pairing negative feelings with positive coping statements. And just to reinforce, as I said earlier, avoid asking why. When they're feeling a certain way and it, it's really quite overwhelming for them, they, they will have no idea or they may not have the words to actually describe the reason for their feelings. So it's important just to avoid that. And a quick focus here on tantrums. This is quite important to, to factor in when we are emotion coaching or trying to develop our skills in this area. And we know the difference. We can see the upstairs tantrum, I call it, when a child decides to throw a fit. They could stop if they wanted to. And you know this when you actually look at the child and you can see them looking back at you to see if they're looking at you. It's almost like they're trying to say, look, 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 I'm, I'm beginning to get a bit angry now, but actually I could control this. But if I got my own way, it would really help. Um, they may look out of control, but actually they're still able to control their emotions and make decisions. So at this point, what they need are really firm boundaries and a clear discussion about appropriate and inappropriate behaviour. When a child experiences what we call a downstairs tantrum, this is basically when their upstairs brain is just not being used. They can't use it. They've been emotionally hijacked because they're so upset. They flip their lid, basically. So the amygdala has hijacked the higher parts of their brain. At this point, all a child needs is nurturing, comforting and soothing. There is no point here in talking about consequences or appropriate behaviour. Very important to remember that and make that distinction. So if you have some time to reflect on this or you want to just take a pen and pencil out and have or pen, sorry, and have a go at thinking about what you would do, what you would say here um, using the three steps. So just thinking about these particular scenarios, pick one that may be relevant to you or your age group of children or young people and think about how you would actually work through those three key steps, what you would say, what scripts you would develop for each of the stages. So I just want to highlight some resources here. We have this emotion coaching resource bank for parents, carers and professionals for Nurture UK. It was then Nurture um, Group Network. Um, and I've also listed some other um, ones here that I've taken some of these resources and ideas and slides from. So all of these references are really relevant to this presentation. And a key resource you might want to have a look at from Hinton House Publishers um, 
I think most of the um, ideas in this presentation will be found in this Essential Resilience and Wellbeing Toolkit for Early Years. There's a big section on emotion coaching and lots and lots of very helpful tools and strategies around self-soothing and how to develop that, that set of skills, um, both for ourselves and with our children and young people. And here are just a few more um, seminal resources I suppose really the one dealing with feeling was my first ever publication and I still think it has real relevance to the whole area of teaching and developing emotional literacy in children and young people. So thank you very much for listening and I hope that this has been helpful it's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour um, but I think if you're new to emotion coaching and, and the development of emotional literacy, then this will hopefully have been helpful and given you a taster and you can think about how you might want to move forward and further to, de to develop your skills and your knowledge base in this whole area. Um, I hope you'll join me for the next session in this Coffee Time CPD series. I uh, look forward to developing that in the next few days. Thank you.